Hi everyone, Dicko here with a new kick-ass walkthrough. Today I'm going to talk about a few things you should know about the transition from Maya to Blender. Now I have used both softwares for years, but as I ventured forward as an independent freelance artist, and now a full-time artist in the motion graphics house, I can say with absolute certainty that now is the prime time for independent artists and small studios to give Blender a red-hot go. Now this isn't an argument about which software is best. That in my opinion is a ridiculous debate. Maya has entrenched itself as the go-to 3D animation suite for good reasons, especially in large productions. However, for independent artists and smaller studios, I believe that the advantages of using Maya as their daily driver are quickly becoming less and less obvious. Aside from the monthly cost of the basic software package, the additional cost of purchasing render engines, add-ons and features can lead one to seriously question whether being a 3D artist is actually worth it. And let's not even get start with the stability issues that come with using Maya. Fuck me, I could rant about that one all day. Nah, for me, personally, I need something that gives me value for money, that is powerful, and yes, most of all, is stable. Working in a studio that deals with wildly different projects every couple of weeks means that I can't be dicking around for hours trying to figure out why rotating this cube in a particular way causes my software to crash. Luckily, Blender has all three of these features in spades, and with the latest 2.8 release, I can actually say with confidence that for 80-90% to 90 of my daily requirements, Blender can do almost all of them out of the tin. Now this isn't going to be some in-depth walkthrough of Blender's features, and what its shortcuts are for every feature. For that, just install the damn program and look at the keyboard shortcuts. It's really not that hard. The only thing you're fighting against is old habits. And yes, if you're still going to be a stubborn little prick, there's an industry compatible key map for you to switch to. Nah, this is a quick walkthrough for professionals who want to try Blender but also want to get shit done. You need to know where the important shit is and well, I thought I'd help you find it. And you may even find that the differences between Maya and Blender really aren't that different in many ways. Okay, so I'm going to break this video down into a few short chunks, starting with basic layout, switching modes, object properties, editing your workspace, add-ons and customization, the outliner and render layers, and finally, rendering and managing those renders. Okay, so here I have Maya on the left and Blender on the right. Both are grey and have flat icons. Okay, that's about it. See you next week. Nah, but seriously, if I was squinting, they'd literally look like the same shit. I've added a cube in Maya because it will be important in a moment. Anyway, so both softwares have an outliner, an attribute editor, and some quick navigation buttons. In Maya, your viewport display settings sit on the top of your viewport window. In Blender, these settings are nested under these buttons here. Turning off the visibility of certain objects basically works identically between the two softwares. The awesome thing about Blender's approach is that not only can you hide specific kinds of objects, but you can toggle on or off their selectability, which is pretty sweet. In Maya, the scene orientation widget sits on the bottom left corner. In Blender, it sits on the top right. Again, Blender has some extra usability here because you can pan, rotate, and zoom in your scene using these buttons. It's pretty useful if you're using a trackpad or pen input. In Maya, you can switch between your workspaces in the Windows panel, in Blender, just click on one of these tabs. Tool buttons and right-click menus are contextual to whatever workspace you're in, so that's also a bonus. A plus to the Blender devs there. At the bottom of the screen, you have the timeline in both softwares. And again, both have a tooltip panel at the bottom. The nice thing about Blender is that with its user interface design, it largely prohibits floating windows. So those tooltips will never be obscured by minimized windows within the software. Unlike Maya, seriously guys, why the fuck hasn't this been addressed? It drives me up the wall whenever I want to try a new tool in Maya and need it quick. In Maya, tool specific options are available when you double click on a tool. In Blender, they are accessible next to the transform panel on a tab. Just click on that tab to see the options for that tool. Alternatively, the same tool settings can be accessed in the properties panel on the top button. With Maya, the quickest way to switch modes is to select your object, then right click and drag to open the pie menu to edit the object's properties. In Blender, there's a clear break between what is called object mode and edit mode. Pressing tab on your keyboard will automatically switch your object into edit mode, which will then let you start pushing your verts, edges and faces. 
You will also see that the side panel changes with the new buttons that are contextual with the edit mode, such as the knife tool, extrude, bevel, etc. Unlike Maya, these tools are completely destructive. Objects do not have a history to them. However, non-destructive modeling methods come in the form of the modifier stack, which is available for most objects in Blender. They can be accessed in the properties panel. There is more than just the edit mode, however. There are also modes for weight painting, sculpting, texturing, rigging, etc. They can be accessed from the panel here. You can always tab back into edit mode from any of these additional modes. Pressing control tab will open up a pie menu similar to Maya to quickly switch between the modes on the fly. Both Maya and Blender have the equivalent of a transform or channel box panel and an attribute or properties panel. In Maya, pressing Ctrl A switches between these two panels by default. In Blender, these two panels are entirely separate. The transform properties for an object can always be accessible in the viewport. Pressing N on the keyboard can minimize or maximize this panel. And just like Maya, an object's transform properties can be accessed in its attribute or properties panel. For non-destructive properties of an object, Maya holds an object's history in the channel box. In Blender, adding non-destructive modeling properties are done in the modifier stack. In the same attribute editor, you will see options for adding constraints, physics, hair systems, blend shapes, vertex weights, and materials. Now so far, Blender and Maya haven't really seemed all that different to one another, fundamentally. But that's about to change when it comes to editing your workspace. In Blender, because by default there are no such things as floating windows, any part of your workspace can be switched from one editor to another. If I click on this button, what pops up is a multitude of editors. Node editors for materials, video sequences, compositor graph editors, etc. If I want to split an editor into two, I click on the corner of one of my workspaces and drag it open. I can then switch it to whatever editor I need. Conversely, I can click on the tabs on the top to instantly transform my workspace. I can also save custom ones to suit my workflow, but I find that the defaults work well for me. To collapse editors, right click on the line that separates the two. Then you'll get an option to merge the windows left, right, up or down, depending on your layout. It's worth noting though, that editors are only collapsible if they sit parallel to one another. And if you really need to use that sweet, sweet screen space on your second monitor, there is an option to tear off an editor and create a new window. Unlike Maya, which has a multitude of windows for add-ons, customization, and properties, Blender has a single window that consolidates all of these things. They can be accessed by clicking Edit, then Preferences. Here, you'll be able to access and install new add-ons, customize your Blender theme, turn off or on your graphics card usage, and edit your key maps. If you feel like you need to ease into the Blender workflow, there is a handy industry key map for you to switch to. And when I say you can customize your Blender theme, I'm talking really customize it, like Winamp circa 2001 level of customization. It's that flexible. Speaking of the consolidation of feature sets, one of the biggest differences in my opinion is how Blender and Maya handle their use of the outliner. In Blender 2.8, the outliner not only offers a quick access to all of your objects in the scene, but it also has consolidated itself into a fully fledged render layer manager. Here you can select which objects are selectable, which are visible in the viewport, whether they are renderable, and even advanced features such as holdouts. The other big difference here is that unlike Maya, Blender doesn't support groups as you understand them in Maya. If you want to nest a bunch of objects into a single group, you need to create a parent object first, such as an empty. In Maya, these are called locators. Furthermore, objects are organized into what is called collections. Collections are similar to the render layer groups you can assign in Maya's render setup manager. However, unlike Maya's approach, Blender's collections aren't fucking stupid and will recognize when you rename an object or move it out of a nested hierarchy. Collections can also be switched on or off completely within a scene which means they are completely ignored by any calculations come rendering time. I will say, however, that Maya's outliner has one key advantage. And what that is, 
is that you can actually select any constraints or hair systems or whatever that happen to be assigned to an object in the outliner. In Blender, currently this is not possible. You still have to go to the properties panel of that selected object to change any of the properties of that, of that uh, system. Lucky number seven. Now, speaking of rendering previously, it's time to talk about render layer management and AOVs. Now, in Maya, this is generally handled by the aforementioned render setup manager and the render settings of whatever renderer you have installed, for example, Arnold. Here, you would normally choose which objects you want to render in the render setup manager, and then you would use the render settings to add your render passes to the list, and then the renderer will automatically batch those out with a proper file name for each pass. It's pretty straightforward. Now, Blender's management of AOVs in particular is to put it bluntly, a bit of a clusterfuck. And the reason is simple. Blender currently has no dedicated AOV manager. There are a couple of logical reasons for this to be sure. It's mainly because Blender has its own built-in compositor. So the idea is that if you composite in Blender, you have a single node that stores all of your AOVs for that particular render in a render layer node. However, it's not likely that you're gonna be compositing completely in Blender. I never do that either. So let's just run through step-by-step step how to export those AOVs as separate files. We will start from the beginning. So Blender has what is called view layers, which work in conjunction with the outliners collection system. This part is actually pretty fucking awesome because it lets you create new render layers on the fly by turning off and on collections and choosing whether or not objects in the view layer have specific properties such as holdouts, non-rendering, etc. Each view layer can have their own set of AOVs to be saved out by clicking this button in the properties tab. As you can see, it has all the features you'd expect from a modern render engine. If I open up the compositor window, you will see that as I click to enable these different render passes, there is a new node output on that output node. Now to get these passes to automatically save out of Blender, we need to add an output file node for each render pass. We then gotta be careful to give each node the right file name output. It's tedious and slow, but it can be quite powerful if you want to output combinations of passes. The other nice thing I like about the node system is that it makes you less prone to forget certain things. Um, whereas with a sort of like checkbox system, you kind of are, I find myself more likely to sort of forget to turn on a certain pass. But when you have like a sort of visual system that helps you aid in that sort of output, that you're kind of more likely to see those things that you forget. I'm hoping that in a future update, they have a way of automating this process, but right now it doesn't exist. For your global render engine settings, they too are accessible in the properties panel. This is also where you can switch between your installed render engines. Blender's real-time renderer EV is on by default. However, if you're shooting for quality, Cycles is still the king. If you have Octane for Blender installed, this is also where you would switch it on. Uh, word to the wise though, uh, Blender's Play Blast functionality is tied directly to the render output settings. So if you have already rendered a part of your scene and aren't careful about changing your outputs, Blender will override your previously rendered images with a Play Blast. I know, this is fucking stupid. And I thought I'd tell you just to be careful. I'm really, really, really hoping this gets addressed in a future update of Blender. So there's my breakdown of all the big things to consider when moving from Maya to Blender. My future walkthroughs will delve deeper into specific methodologies of modeling, rigging, and animation. In other words, the really fun stuff. So I hope you can stick around for the ride because I've got some awesome stuff coming. So please like, subscribe, and hit that notification button for more kick-ass walkthroughs. Catches.